with changes in the uh, global economy, the global opening up of global markets, uh, changing uh, regulations by government in the financial system, uh, and uh, new advances in technology, the financial service, services industry is seeing some huge changes uh, today, and, and we'll see more going forward. This chapter will take a look at the financial services uh, industry and take a look at the concept of money uh, as we go through chapter 17. Finance is one of the more critical um, components of operating a business. Uh, to be able to operate a successful business, uh, businesses need to ensure that they have a supply of money to continue to pay their bills and um, uh, expand their operations, make sure they can pay their employees on time. So we'll take a look at uh, the financial services industry in this chapter. Here are some of the learning outcomes for this chapter. Um, we're going to start by taking a look at uh, some of the characteristics and functions of money. We're going to spend some time looking at the Bank of Canada and how they um, regulate the uh, Canadian money supply. And in chapter two, we're going to take a little bit more of a closer look at the Bank of Canada and how it regulates uh, the economy. We're going to take a look at some of the key financial institutions and the different roles they play. Take a look at uh, what Canada Deposit Insurance Corporation does to protect uh, uh, Canadians. And take a look at the role of Canadian banks in the international marketplace. Well, the, the last part of this chapter will take a look at different types of investment. So we're going to spend some time talking about common shares, preferred shares. Um, we'll take a look at uh, using bonds as a financing source. And we'll take a look at some of the other securities, pr primarily mutual funds, uh, that are available to investors. We'll also start uh, to take a look at what we term the security markets. And again, we'll end the chapter with some of the trends that are uh, affecting the financial services industry today. So when we talk about money, money really is anything that is accepted by a society in, for payment of goods and services. Some of us save money, some of us invest money, some of us are really good at spending money. So what is this concept of money? For money to be a suitable um, means of exchange of values, it needs to have four primary characteristics. First of all, money needs to be somewhat scarce. That means it can't be available everywhere. Uh, it should be uh, relatively difficult or very difficult to uh, uh, to counterfeit and create your own supply of money. That is one of the functions of the Bank of Canada to uh, uh, control the money supply, the amount of money that's in circulation. Uh, so money has to be uh, scarce. Uh, throughout time various things have been used uh, for money. Um, brass coins at one time were used as a form of money. In Canada, playing cards were used as a form of money. Um, pebbles in history have been used as money. None of these things really worked very well because they weren't as scarce as um, uh, money should be. Second of all, money must be durable. So um, using a perishable item such as an apple or uh, vegetables as a form of money really wouldn't work very well because over time it would uh, perish and, and, and disappear and become useless. Uh, so, so typically even early societies used things that were more durable, metals uh, and even some paper money in the form of playing cards were used that were a little bit more durable than uh, some other goods. Money must be portable, have to be easily moved around uh, so that you can exchange it easily from one person to another. At one time, um, livestock was used as a form of money to pay for other goods and services. Didn't really work very well because uh, it was very difficult to drag a cow along uh, to pay for goods and services when you went to the market, for instance. Another characteristic of money is it must be divisible. So it must be divided into smaller parts. 
uh, money is a measure of the uh, uh, exchange of value and um, uh, sometimes you have smaller purchases so you would need something that can be divided into smaller quantities to pay for smaller purchases. So those are the primary characteristics of money. Now let's take a look at some of the functions of money or what. <clears throat> so for money to be accept acceptable, it has to uh, function as a medium of exchange, a standard of value, and a store of value. Those are the three primary functions of money. As a medium of exchange, money makes transactions easier. Somebody uh, is selling something that you want, money forms the basis of exchanging money for the good or the service that you are about to be to receive. Much easier than a barter system. A barter system exchanges goods for goods. You give me this 12 dozen eggs, I will give you uh, this uh, bushel full of potatoes. So by having money, it, it, it serves to facilitate those transactions. Um, in, uh, in, in the marketplace. Money also needs to serve as a store of value. Uh, money is a measure of the unit of worth of a goods or service. So as a store of uh, value, money is used to hold wealth or measure wealth. It should retain its value over a period of uh, time because some people may not need to spend their money today. They may not have an immediate need to consume. So the money should be able to store that value to accommodate future purposes. And finally, money is a store of uh, uh, wealth or is a means to hold wealth. Uh, so if it retains its value over time, you can accumulate money and accumulate wealth for future uh, transactions, for future purposes. Um, before we go on, I want to introduce some of the basic terms when we're talking about money because there are different uh, forms of money in what we call the Canadian money supply. So when we talk about currency, we're going to be talking about banknotes and coins. These are the things that you're carrying around in your pocket and, and your wallet. That is what we call currency. Demand deposits is money that's kept into in an account with a financial institution. And that money can be withdrawn on demand. So you can walk into your bank or your financial institution and take out that money. Not all deposits are demand deposits, meaning some deposits uh, are uh, uh, time deposits or they're restricted. You cannot just go in and demand uh, payment or withdraw them from your account. Time deposits are a money that is invested for a specific of time. So again, time deposits are held with financial institutions and it's money that you might invest for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days or, or even longer. And uh, during the time that it's invested, you do not have access to that money. Typically in return, uh, you will earn a higher interest rate for uh, that investment. Term deposits are, again, typically paid interest, cannot be withdrawn on demand. They're fixed. They are committed to stay with that financial institution for a certain period of time, i.e. the length of the term. In the Canadian money supply, there's three different measures of the amount of money that's floating around the economy. We call these M1, M2, or M2+, plus, and M2+. Plus. So let's talk about those three uh, 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 sources of money or measures of money supply in Canada. M1 is the narrowest definition of money. It really includes all the currency, so that's the banknotes and the coins, plus demand deposits. Those are the deposits you can demand at any point in time um, uh, at financial institutions, as well as the money in uh, what we call current accounts. And current accounts are usually business accounts that they can demand um, um, from the bank at any point in time. Um, this M1 definition would always also include things like traveler's checks that you uh, that you might have. 
uh, um, uh, money orders that are floating around drafts that are floating around the money supply. So M1 is the narrowest definition of money. In circulation in 2010, uh, there was about uh, uh, just over five and a half mil, uh, million dollars of M1 floating around the uh, economy in Canada. M2 is a bit more of a broader measure, and so includes everything that's in M1, uh, but also includes um, personal savings accounts uh, and other checking accounts, term deposits, uh, and and some of the uh, uh, business deposits that might need notice before being withdrawn from the bank. So it's a little bit more of a broader definition of money. And there was just under a billion dollars, or twice the M1, that was floating around in the economy in uh, 2010, or a billion dollars. <clears throat> um, M2 plus, and sometimes it's called M3, uh, includes everything that's in M1, everything that's in M2, but it also includes all deposits that are at non-bank financial institutions. So non-bank financial institutions might be money market funds, they might be insurance companies, uh, there are other providers of uh, uh, financial savings. Uh, so if we include all of the deposits that were, are with those non-bank financial institutions, we would arrive at something that we call M2+. Plus. And there was about $1.4 billion of uh, uh, M2 plus definition of money sitting in the uh, Canadian economy in 2010. A lot of us might think that credit cards are part of the money supply, when in fact they're really not, because credit cards are not money per se, they are a loan. They are uh, um, uh, uh, a means to, to effect consumption today and pay the money back in the future. So credit cards really do not replace money uh, at all and are not included in the definition of uh, the money supply. The Bank of Canada is uh, really charged with managing the money supply in Canada. Uh, and uh, it has various tools at its disposal to either increase or shrink the money supply in Canada. And when the Bank of Canada does that, it can affect the whole economy uh, in Canada. Bank of Canada came about in 1934. Before, uh, um, before the Bank of Canada came into existence, many of the banks uh, um, produced or printed their own money. And you can actually find some Bank of Montreal notes today, some Bank of uh, Nova Scotia currency, if you go looking on uh, uh, eBay and that sort of thing. So it's really interesting to see the different currency that was in place in Canada. It w recognizing a need for a central uh, bank, uh, the, the government of Canada created the Bank of Canada in 1934 and in 1938 it became a crown corporation which really belonged to the federal government um, with all the shares held by the uh, Minister of Finance. So the the Bank of Montreal, uh, sorry, the Bank of Canada uh, promotes the 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 uh, regulates the financial economy in Canada by performing various services. One of those is conducting monetary policy, and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, primarily in Chapter Two. Um, but uh, the ba the the Bank of Canada will conduct monetary policy in Canada and regulate the 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 economy. The Bank of Canada today is the sole supplier of uh, 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 supplying banknotes. So the, it uh, regulates how much mo money or, or currency can be printed by the Canadian, um, the Canadian Mint. One of the, the main goals of the Bank of Canada as well is to provide the safety and efficiency of our financial system. So making sure that we've got a very strong financial system. Uh, system. Uh, having a strong financial uh, system is uh, paramount to the success of any economy. We've seen uh, what can happen, for instance, in Iceland in 2008-2009, uh, uh, their financial system collapsed. And what that did was caused 
the the whole uh, country of Iceland to virtually go bankrupt because of the collapse in their financial s system. So it's really key that the Bank of Canada promotes the safety and the efficiency of uh, the Canadian banking system, the financial system in Canada. The um, Bank of Canada also provides some funds management services uh, and acts as an overnight lender between the banks um, in facilitating the, uh, the, the, the payment system in Canada. And of course, the Bank of Canada communicates its objectives openly and effectively. Uh, they are accountable for their actions, and so they are quite transparent with uh, uh, the decisions that they they make. As we said, the Bank of Canada is the sole provider of banknotes, and one of the ways that it promotes the safety and efficiency of the banking system is by having a currency that is very, very difficult to uh, uh, to to duplicate to to counterfeit, uh, and as a consequence of that, uh, we are seeing some new bills being introduced into the um, into the money supply, uh, which makes it a lot more difficult for uh, individuals to counterfeit. So it's very secure. Uh, this new money uh, is uh, almost plastic, if you feel it, is, is expected to last uh, quite a bit longer than, than the former notes that we, we had. So let's talk a little bit about monetary policy. One of the most important functions of the Bank of Canada is to control the monetary policy in Canada. So the Bank of Canada uses uh, some tools and its power to change the money supply, to control inflation and inter interest rates, which in terms affects uh, the amount of employ employment in the economy and influences uh, economic activity. Uh, and we'll see more of that in Chapter 2. Two of the tools used by the Bank of Canada in managing the, the money supply are what we call open market operations and the overnight rate. So let's talk about open market operations. The government, uh, the Bank of Canada, uh, is a large purchaser of government securities. And government securities are uh, uh, typically debt instruments of the federal government. Uh, the government needs money, so they issue uh, securities investors buy those securities. By buying government securities, by the Bank, Bank of Canada going to the market and buying back government securities that are offered for sale in the market, they can increase the money supply. So think about that. The government, uh, through the Bank of Canada, goes to the market and buys back some of those investments that individuals or businesses or pension funds are holding. So what that does is puts money, spendable money, uh, back into the hands of those investors so they can use it to spend on other goods and services. What that does is will stimulate the economy because there's more money supply, more money in the money supply. People have more ability to purchase other goods and services. So by bu buying government securities, it will increase uh, the, the demand for other goods and services and, in fact, stimulate the economy. If it stimulates the economy, what happens is more people are employed, so the unemployment rate uh, goes down. Con conversely, Sometimes the government will sell government securities. So through the Bank of Canada, we'll actually sell, uh, uh, create some new investments for investors to purchase. Uh, and what that does is decreases the money supply. So in exchange for the currency that you've got, the, the Bank of Canada will sell government securities, and that reduces that reduces the amount of uh, money that's in the M1 and M2 definitions, so, so reduces the amount of money in the economy. And what that does will slow down the purchase of goods and services, slow down the economy, it will uh, uh, 
act to decrease uh, price increases or inflation, and we'll talk about more of these things late in Chapter 2. But it'll slow down the, the economy. The second way, the second tool in the monetary policy tool back the box that the Bank of Canada has is uh, the overnight rate. Basically, uh, the overnight rate is the rate of interest that the Bank of Canada charges uh, other banks uh, that borrow from the Bank of Canada. So through the clearing system, um, banks may owe money to the other financial institution based on the value of checks and, and um, transfers uh, between one bank to the other. And often they will borrow that money overnight from the Bank of Canada, who has a role in facilitating the payment system in Canada. So by regulating the target for the overnight rate, so that's the interest rate that the banks pay uh, uh, between each other, they can stimulate or slow down the economy. For instance, let's say, uh, let's say the economy was overheated, there was a lot of money in the economy, uh, consumers were in a spending frenzy, what was happening is there wasn't enough goods and services, prices were going up, um, uh, uh, unemployment was, was too low perhaps, uh, so the uh, Bank of Canada might raise the overnight rate. By raising the overnight rate, that uh, causes interest rates in the economy to go up. What will happen is it will um, it will decrease the, uh, the the money supply by because uh, people will tend to want to save money more. That interest rates are going up, they will save money as as opposed to spending money, which will reduce the amount of money in the money supply and in fact then will slow down the economy and take some of the upward pressure on price increases out of the economy. Conversely, if the money, if the economy is rather slow and sluggish, uh, the, the Bank of Canada through its monetary policy might decide to lower the overnight rate. So by lowering the overnight light, night rate, interest rates go down, it encourages uh, people to stop investing or saving their money but to spend their money, uh, it will increase the money supply and in fact will stimulate the economy so con as consumers are now spending their money on other goods and services uh, which creates increased demand in the economy and uh, uh, businesses will step up production, they will start hiring employees back and that sort of thing. So so it's a, it's a real cycle and uh, the Bank of Canada has a really critical role in regulating the economy through its uh, monetary policy. This slide can just be used for study purposes. So, uh, so think about think about what would ha really happen if the Bank of Canada bought or sold government securities, or raised or lowered the overnight rate. Make sure you have a clear understanding of how that can affect both interest rates, the money supply, and economic activity in Canada. The next part of the chapter talks uh, about the Canadian financial uh, system and understanding how it works and uh, who some of the key players are. Um, it, it's very important to any economy to have a very strong financial system. As I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, the country of Iceland did not have a very strong financial um, uh, uh, services industry and that of that resulted in the collapse of uh, some of their banks which led the country into uh, bankruptcy. Canada is fortunate uh, as having one of the best financial uh, services industry in the world. It is highly respected for the security and the role that it plays in regulating the Canadian economy and having a, a very strong financial system in Canada really supports uh, Canadians to have a very high standard of living. Um, so at any time in, in an economy we've got uh, two groups of, of people really. Uh, the, in the financial sector there are people who want, need money, demanders of funds. Uh, these uh, typically 
are businesses or governments who are looking for funds to expand or uh, increase, uh, do, do research, or in the case of the government, they need funds to provide the social programs and build infrastructure, roads, and that sort of thing. So we have some demanders of funds. Uh, right now, as you're going through university, you might be a demander of funds because you need to pay for your education and uh, uh, pay your tuition today uh, when your income stream will come later on down the road. So you might be a demander of funds today. The under, other end of the spectrum, we have suppliers of funds. So those are uh, groups that have uh, surplus uh, funds or, and they need to invest that to uh, generate a return to increase their wealth. So uh, we have one group who demands funds and others who supply funds. And financial intermediaries are the group of uh, 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 businesses in between who facilitate that exchange. Uh, they, t they take, um, they take uh, some of the money that uh, suppliers of funds have and they lend it in the form of loans to demanders of funds who in turn pay interest to the financial intermediary who then in turn pays some of those um, some of that interest back to the suppliers of funds. Typically in Canada there's really four pillars of the financial system or the financial intermediaries in Canada. Uh, those typically are banks, trust companies, insurance companies, and investment dealers. And we'll take a closer look of a look at uh, each of those in uh, in a minute. So financial institutions are really at the heart of the the whole financial system in Canada, and uh, they are they they provide their basic function is to provide facilitate that exchange between the demanders of funds and the suppliers of funds. So let's take a look at some of those uh, four pillars of the financial uh, services industry in Canada. So when we talk about those financial in, uh, intermediaries, uh, um, we said that there were four primary groups, banks, trust companies, insurance companies, and investment dealers. Uh, chartered banks are a form of depository financial institutions. Uh, so they are deposits, or they are institutions that can take deposits from individuals. Uh, so they, typically it's your credit union, trust companies, chartered banks. So they take deposits from uh, suppliers of, uh, uh, of funds. In Canada, uh, the largest component of that would be the chartered banks. So uh, today, there are about 21 uh, domestic banks or, or Canadian-owned banks in Canada, uh, as well as uh, a large number, 25, I believe, of, of uh, subsidiaries of foreign banks, so American banks or, or European banks that do business in Canada. Um, so the banks form a basis of uh, uh, facilitating the exchange between demanders and suppliers of funds in Canada. Tr <coughs> Excuse me. Trust companies are, again, they do take deposits, but they're the only financial institution that they are allowed to administer trusts. For instance, they can uh, manage estates or manage trusts. So if money is held in trust for a specific purpose or a specific individual, uh, trust companies are the only ones that are um, uh, allowed to administer those trusts. There's a little bit of um, change in the financial services industry today between the those four pillars because the walls between those four pillars are breaking down. So in 1990s the regulations changed so that uh, banks could now own trust companies before they couldn't. So we see um, 
some movement or some changes in the financial services industry. For instance, the TD Bank um, bought uh, uh, Canada Trust and became TD Canada Trust. Similarly, other banks have since purchased uh, trust companies to expand their services. Credit unions and caisse populaires, we'll talk a bit more about later, but they are, again, uh, uh, financial institutions that are really um, not-for-profit organizations. They are cooperatives that are owned by the members, and they provide a service uh, that is common to the members that belong to that uh, credit union. There are other non-depository financial institutions uh, that are in the uh, financial services industry. These institutions do not take direct deposits, so they typically do not operate checking accounts and savings accounts type of things, but they do have other forms of investments uh, where they provide uh, an investment vehicle for those suppliers of funds. For instance, insurance companies are a major f supplier of funds. Policyholders that have insurance policies pay premiums to those financial uh, to those insurance companies and the insurance companies takes those premiums or the amounts that you pay for your policy and invest it in other types of investments real estate sometimes um, uh, they might invest it in, in other bonds um, uh, perhaps some some uh, share certificates so they're a non-depository instrument uh, institution, but they do have premiums, they do have funds to invest. Pension funds, similarly, are the companies that manage your parents' uh, pension plans. So they have large pools of money. They don't take deposits, so they're a non-depository financial institution, but they do have large sums of money that they're holding on to until somebody retires and then they start paying it back. So during the time that they've got these these pools of, of, of money, they need to invest it and they will invest it again in businesses and governments and various securities to generate a return for uh, uh, the members of the pension plans. Brokerage companies are companies that uh, buy and sell securities uh, for clients and, and provide uh, investment advice to their to their clients as well. So again, another form of non-depository financial institution. And finance companies also uh, are a non-depository financial institution. And basically, finance companies make short-term loans. Um, uh, typically, or some of the more common ones are when you buy furniture, you're probably on credit, you're probably dealing through a finance company. If you buy a car, uh, finance companies like G GMAC, Ford Finance, or Ford Credit provide financing for the purchase of those goods and uh, services. Consumer finance companies also exist, and they make loans to uh, individuals, typically shorter-term loans to individuals as well. Uh, so they provide uh, some financial intermediary services for the demanders of funds in the uh, financial, uh, financial system. The uh, Canadian Deposit Insurance Corporation is another crown corporation that was established in 1967. And the goal of it was to um, provide a measure of protection to Canadians. So CDIC is a crown corporation and uh, it will insure eligible deposits up to $100,000. So in the event of uh, the collapse of a bank, for instance, if you've got uh, money invested with a, um, a, a chartered bank and uh, that bank happens to collapse or fold for whatever reason, can't pay you your deposit back, Canada, Canada Deposit Insurance Corporation will um, insure your deposit guarantee that you get uh, your funds back up to the maximum amount of one hundred thousand dollars so uh, they it is a, an organization that is meant to uh, create some safety and stability in the Canadian banking system in uh, the last oh 10 15 years the financial services industry has really opened up globally and um, uh, uh, 
the, the financial marketplace has, in fact, gone global. And so there's a lot more money passing between uh, Canada and foreign countries and vice versa. So, uh, and, and many corporations that exist today are multinational corporations. They've got offices and plants and facilities in many countries along around the world. So the financial services industry in Canada is forced to expand into international banking. So uh, financial services companies in Canada today will provide loans in foreign currencies, in euros, in, in U.S. dollars, for instance, uh, to, to provide funds to those demanders of, uh, 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 of funds in the marketplace. Many uh, of the uh, financial institutions as well will offer trade-related services, so services to help facilitate payment uh, uh, between ver uh, 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 businesses in, in two different countries. Uh, they will offer things like letters of credit to facilitate the importation of goods. They will facilitate uh, trade services or exchange services to allow you to exchange uh, U.S. dollars for Canadian dollars, etc. And they really help uh, provide uh, companies in Canada with the ability to better manage their cash flows. Uh, uh, they increase the, the efficiency of the payment system when there's uh, foreign currencies involved. Many banks in Canada now own um, uh, uh, international banks. For instance, BMO owns a Harris Bank in the United States, which is a large um, uh, uh, bank in uh, the United States. So uh, Canadian companies are, are looking for those international banking opportunities uh, in, uh, to, to be able to expand. Similarly, there is a lot more foreign banks that are competing in, in Canada. We've all seen the commercials for ING Direct, which is a Dutch bank that uh, provides some um, banking services, limited banking services, in, um, in Canada. The last part of your the part of your chapter talks about some of the choices for investors as uh, suppliers of money and the way that different securities can facilitate the exchange between those suppliers of money and those uh, banks and corporations that are demanders of funds uh, all through the financial intermediaries. So um, this part of the chapter I'm really going to focus on uh, talking from the supplier of money or the investors point of, uh, point of view. Um, so when we talk about securities Securities are really investment certificates that rep either represent ownership in businesses or a loan to businesses. Uh, so uh, securities can either be um, what we call equity securities, which really represent ownership in the issuing uh, organization, or debt, which is a form of a loan to the issuer. So, so investors are looking to um, uh, earn a return on their investment, and corporations or governments, which are the demanders of funds, are looking for those that money to be able to expand and um, um, uh, build infrastructure and social programs and that sort of thing. So corporations and governments sell securities to investors, and those investors take on a certain amount of risk with the hope of receiving a profit from their investment. Um, equity securities, when we talk about equity securities, uh, which represent ownership interest, are typically called shares. And we're going to talk about the two different types of shares or equity interests that an investor might have in, in a business. Uh, those are common or preferred, and we'll talk about those on the next slide. Um, the other form or debt instruments or debt securities are typically called bonds. So these are typically long-term loans that the government or large corporations um, uh, have owing to investors. And we'll take a look at the different types of uh, bonds and the different characteristics of some of the bonds in the markets uh, today. So when we talk about those equity securities, 
we're talking about shares. And there's two primary forms of shares. Common shares really represent the true ownership in a business. You or your parents might own some shares in a large corporation. For instance, I own uh, a number of shares, common shares, in uh, Bank of Montreal. So I am a part owner of Bank of Montreal and many other companies. Um, so common shares are, are the most uh, common form of ownership. Common shareholders have voting rights. So as a shareholder, uh, which means I'm an investor by way of shares in a corporation, I have voting rights. Uh, so I can influence through my vote uh, the, the board of directors who effectively manages the corporation. So I can vote on many of the important issues and decisions of the company and uh, uh, can hopefully influence the, the success of that, of that uh, company. In return, um, common share or companies will pay back or may pay back dividends to investors. As an investor in common shares, I'm really looking to get uh, a return on my investment. So I need a, re a reward for uh, risking my money and investing it by buying Bank of Montreal stock, for instance. So I can look towards a return in one of two ways. Um, um, my return might be in the form of dividends or my return might be in the form of capital appreciation. That means the value of each share that I own will increase. So if the value of each share increases, I will increase my wealth. And that, in turn, forms part of the return that I am getting from, uh, by holding shares in Bank of Montreal. Dividends are a means where uh, a company will sh share in the success of their business by giving some money back to uh, its shareholders. So uh, the company, uh, BMO in this case, may uh, return some of the profits that it makes by being in business to its shareholders and that, that uh, uh, is called a dividend. Dividends uh, for common shares usually can be paid in cash, or sometimes uh, the the corporation may may uh, uh, may authorize a, a stock dividend, which means they'll give me more shares of the company. So that in turn will increase my wealth as well. Some companies, however, choose not to pay dividends, and when they do that, they're they're instead of sharing the profits with the investors, they will retain those profits in the company, and look towards expand. And as they expand, they will uh, increase the value of those shares in the company. One of the primary advantage of common shares is its liquidity, and liquidity means the the ease with which an investor can buy and sell those shares. For instance, if tomorrow I decided I did not want to be a shareholder of Bank of Montreal and wanted to invest in something else or I wanted to buy a new house or a car, I could go to one of the markets and actually sell my shares to another investor who might be looking to buy those shares. So um, common shares, typically in large public companies, are very liquid, meaning we can buy and sell them very quickly and very easily. And hopefully when I go to buy those shares, I will earn uh, our, our reward or return on my investment because the value of the share will have gone up through a price increase uh, over the price that I bought it. Keep in mind though that there's no guarantee uh, of any return, either dividends or, or share uh, price appreciation. Uh, the, the value of the shares really is set by the marketplace. Uh, so if there's a high demand for the shares that I am holding, it will increase the value of the shares. Or if, or if the um, uh, investment population believes in the future success of the company, it may drive up the price of the shares and generate a return. Consequently, many shares 
uh, for smaller companies or new companies will often plummet in value and I could actually lose my money. So common shareholders are taking a fair amount of risk in their investment because there's no guarantees. Preferred shares are a second form of corporate ownership. Um, Unlike uh, the common shareholders, preferred shareholders typically don't have voting rights, but they do have some other special uh, privileges over common shareholders. Uh, those privileges pr primarily are in the form of the payment of dividends. So preferred shareholders have to be paid first before uh, dividends before common shareholders. And often a preferred share will have a stipulated or, or stated uh, dividend amount in the uh, contract, which says, for instance, uh, um, the corporation will pay one dollar per preferred share every year. Uh, so that doesn't mean they are going to be paid, but before common shareholders get uh, paid any dividends, any of the dividends that are owing to the preferred shareholders must be paid. Um, so most of these preferred shares are what we call cumulative preferred shares. So it really means the preferred shareholders must receive all their unpaid dividends before any, any dividends can be paid to common shareholders. Um, preferred shares um, holders, uh, preferred shares typically will pay dividends uh, and, and most preferred shareholders are looking towards getting uh, a return on their investment by way of dividends. Uh, the, the, there is some potential for price appreciation and preferred dividends, however it's much less, much less than that of common shareholders. So preferred shareholders really like that fixed dividend income because corporations will cut a dividend check, I don't know, every six months or every year and so they get their return in uh, dividends and so there's less um, potential for price appreciation uh, with preferred shares than there are for common shares. A lot of preferred shares uh, will have other features or benefits attached to them as well. For instance, uh, sometimes those preferred shares will have the uh, uh, option where it will allow the uh, shareholder to to convert them into common shares at a particular point in time or to redeem those shares from the company so going and demanding money back from the company without having to shell, sell them on the open market so there's all sorts of um, features and that uh, uh, companies might include in their preferred share um, uh, capital stock to uh, promote or encourage investors to purchase their preferred preferred shares. Bonds are different from equity securities in that they are debt. Bonds are a form of long-term liabilities of corporations in governments. So they are a long-term loan. So the issuer of the bond, the corporation or the government, must pay the buyer a fixed amount of money uh, in the form of interest, whereas equity securities earn a return by capital appreciation and dividends. Debt holders or bond holders earn their return in the form of uh, uh, interest. Now, interest on bonds is typically uh, called the coupon rate. And so the holders of bonds expect a return, the interest or at the coupon rate. Typically it's paid every six months. It's a fixed interest rate so the the shareholder knows how much interest they will receive uh, every six, month, six months. As well the uh, um, uh, holder of bonds will uh, uh, get back their principal at some future date, usually uh, the maturity date. For instance, I buy a $100,000 bond, it might pay interest at 6% and mature in 25 years. So what that means is every six months I can expect to 
uh, receive $3,000 in interest. That's my interest for the, each six-month period. Uh, and at the end of 25 years, I will receive the, the principal value or the par value, which is the stated contractual amount of the, of the bond. So that $100,000 I will receive back in 25 years. Bonds typically are issued in uh, units of $1,000, uh, $5,000, $10,000. Because um, uh, uh, because bondholders might need their money, they can't wait that 25 years for the bond to mature. There are some markets where uh, secondary markets, uh, and uh, I might be able to go to the market and sell my bond. I own the bond today. I need the money. I can go to the market, and hopefully there's a willing buyer in the market who will buy the uh, bond back from me. Uh, so I can liquid. There is some liquidity in the bond markets as as well. If I go to the markets, uh, the price I get for the bond might not be a hundred thousand dollars. It might be more. So the bond is selling at a premium, or it might be less. The bond is selling at a discount. For instance, if I've got a six percent. $100,000 bond, there's 20 years left to maturity. I need the money today uh, to pay for my daughter's wedding. So I will go to the market and try and sell my bond. If interest rates on similar uh, types of uh, debt vehicles in the market are paying 10%, let's say, who in the right mind would buy a contract that pays a fixed interest rate of 6% and still pay me $100,000 for it? So what will happen, it'll go to the market and I may be able to sell it for something less than the $100,000. Maybe I'll get only get $85,000 for that $100,000 bond contract. Uh, um, so, um, and the difference in price, the, the discount, represents the difference in the interest rate between the interest rate that's fixed in the bond contract and what the market is uh, paying on similarly risk investments today. So I might be able to, I might lose some money on the bond. Uh, I might make some money in, on the bond. If interest rates are paying only 3% and my contract is 6%, it would be highly valued by investors, so they may be w willing to pay me more than the $100,000, which is the principal or, or uh, par value of that bond. There are many types of uh, bonds. Typically, they're issued by large corporations or uh, governments. And corporate bonds typically can be secured or unsecured. To enhance the marketability of those bonds, uh, the bond issuer might provide some security for those bonds. For instance, in the event of non-payment, some of those bonds might be backed by real property, land, buildings, uh, real property. Uh, so we call those mortgage bonds so that in the event of non-payment, if I can't make my payments to the investors, uh, there is some security or collateral uh, that can be liquidated to pay back the bond, bond, uh, um, the bond owners, the bond investors. Unsecured bonds are typically called uh, debentures. So debentures are unsecured bonds, so there is no collateral or no security for repayment of those bonds over the long period of time. Some bonds are convertible, so it allows the uh, bondholder to uh, convert them into equity investments, typically common shares, um, at a stipulated price. Other bonds are called junk bonds, uh, and junk bonds typically have a very high risk, high return. Um, but have a high um, uh, uh, pro possibility of losing all your money. Um, so junk bonds are uh, typically higher risk, and uh, but have the potential for um, higher rates of return. Bonds are uh, bond ratings 
are used to measure the the risk in a bond investment. Uh, and and there are two companies called one called Moody's, one called uh, Standard and Poor's, who provide do analysis of bonds and they provide a rating of that bond. Um, and will rate the bond from either being a prime high quality investment to a very poor quality uh, bond. And you can see some of the ratings in uh, uh, Exhibit 17.6 in your, your textbook. For companies that are very strong, have a very uh, uh, strong ability to repay lower risk bonds, typically would have a triple A rating. So that's the highest rating that can be assigned to a bond. So those are, are good investors, um, uh, good good companies to uh, invest in. However, the rate of return that you will get will be lower than, uh, uh, for, in, for instance, a medium grade bond because the risk is lower. So AAA are the, the most highest quality investment bonds, but will pay or typically should pay a lower rate of return, a lower rate of interest. And we go down from there. We go to uh, B bonds, typically medium grade uh, bonds. And we start getting into some of the junk bonds. So they provide very little protection against default. They might be very speculative, higher risk, uh, and should afford an investor uh, the opportunity for a very high rate of return. And there are some rate bonds that are actually in default. So what that means is the company has missed making an interest payment or and they're close to missing an interest payment. So they will have high risk. There was a very poor quality bonds uh, in, in the market today. So before investing in bonds, make sure you understand the level of a risk that you uh, are undertaking uh, because you may or may not get your money back in the end. We've talked about uh, e equity investments, uh, shares being preferred shares or common shares as a type of security. We've also talked about bonds being a debt uh, security uh, that are issued by uh, corporations and uh, governments. But there are some other types of securities that you should be familiar with that uh, investors or uh, suppliers of funds can invest in to generate a return on their investment. Um, futures contracts, for instance, are legal obligations to buy or sell a, uh, a set quantity of um, uh, a commodity, typically uh, their agriculture or mining products, um, at a, an agreed upon price at a future point in time. Uh, so they are legal obligations to buy or sell uh, those uh, securities at a later date. Um, future, we'll talk more about futures contracts in some of your more advanced financing uh, courses. Options are contracts that um, um, uh, give the option to the whole, uh, give, gives the holder of the option uh, the choice whether to buy or sell specific quantities of a financial instrument instruments at a price during a specific uh, time period. Typically they have very short maturity so it's they're, they're a higher risk investment and um, uh, should only be used by experienced uh, uh, investors. EFTs or, ex, or, or e, uh, ETFs rather are uh, exchange traded funds and they're a new type of an investment uh, and uh, it's really uh, it's, they're really considered to be a special type of mutual fund that I'll talk about in a minute that hold a broad basket of, of marketable securities uh, that all have a common common theme. So uh, they do trade on the stock exchanges and the value changes throughout the day. Mutual funds, though, is one of the more common types of investments, and, and uh, you may already own some uh, mutual funds. Uh, they're a very popular type of uh, investment vehicle. Um, so mutual funds are really financial ser when a financial ser services company uh, pools investors' funds to buy a selection of securities. So let's say I'm the mutual fund um, manager, mutual fund company, 
and each of you in the class have a thousand dollars to invest you could take that thousand dollars and buy you know a thousand dollars worth of BMO shares or you could buy a thousand dollar government bond uh, but your your risk is really related to the su success or failure of the uh, financial institution that you you might be investing in so you're investing in one company so instead I'm a mutual fund uh, manager so I might pool each of the the thousand dollars that uh, you have so if there's I don't know 50 students in the class each one has a thousand dollars I'll take that thousand dollars from each of them and create a pool and from that fifty thousand dollars that I now have I might have the opportunity to buy various shares and various investments so I might take ten thousand dollars invested in BMO and I might take another five thousand dollars invested in a corporate bond to, you know that matures in if 15 years I might invest it in some higher risk shares uh, of companies that are just starting out and, and appear to have a good um, uh, a good probability of success so I might pool that money by a wide wide selection of securities and any of the returns that I will get from investing that fifty thousand dollars I will then divvy it back or give it back to you as an investor based on the proportion of ownership that you have so uh, some of the advantages of mutual funds are uh, that you can diversify instead of buying and diversification means um, uh, spreading your money amount into a larger number of investments so your risk is less so I can um, instead of you holding one share that if that company um, uh, fails you lose all your money whereas if I've got it pooled and buying a hundred different shares if one of those companies fails it doesn't have the same effect you wouldn't lose all of your money so um, mutual funds are a good way to hold a diversified and less and, and hence a less risky portfolio of investments another benefit of mutual funds is that they are professionally managed uh, so uh, managers of these mutual funds do take uh, you know are, are, are trained and there's a lot of regulation and uh, we'll have a team of investors who whose job is to understand the markets and understand the indiv individual investments that they place the the money into and so they are professionally managed so that's one of the advantages to a holder of a mutual fund sometimes mutual funds may offer higher returns than individual investors could achieve on their own uh, because because of the professional investment management uh, hopefully they do a good job and they can increase the rate of return that an individual might get by investing only in uh, a smaller number of funds mutual funds are also very convenient um, so the instead of getting you know instead of getting tax re tax forms from a multitude of uh, uh, companies they consolidate all that information uh, through consolidated statements and tax information as well mutual funds are pretty liquid as well uh, the value of a mutual fund is established at the close of each day so if you wanted to sell you can you can go to your uh, mutual fund company or the markets and sell that uh, that mutual fund so they're fairly liquid as as well um, some of the disadvantages though of mutual funds that you need to be aware of is that first of all that they're not insured by Canada Deposit Insurance Corporation as an investor you lose a little bit of control because you're you are not making the investment decisions you are instead uh, giving the investment decisions to the professional funds manager there are um, um, some fees and expenses that go along with the with mutual funds uh, fees need to be paid to the, the managers of the funds uh, and that is how they make their return and there may be some expenses that they will incur in managing the funds and those expenses are shared amongst all the investors in that particular mutual fund uh, mutual funds typically uh, where it, 
uh, have a value determined at the end uh, or the close of each business day, as opposed to if you owned individual shares, the value of those shares will fluctuate uh, many times during the course of a day. So uh, there is a little bit of limitation in trading uh, for the mutual funds as well. Um, Another cited disadvantage of a mutual fund is that uh, mutual fund companies need to hold a certain amount of the pooled investment or pooled amount of money in uh, cash because some investors might uh, decide to uh, liquidate their, their uh, investment and so the mutual fund company needs to be able to uh, pay them back. So they will typically all hold a certain amount in cash and, and that uh, cash is typically uh, invested at a very low rate of return. However, uh, for many people starting out into mutual funds, it can be a very uh, good type of investment. Um, there are various types of mutual funds. Um, some mutual funds will invest in very low risk investments, uh, T-bills, um, which are uh, short-term instruments of the, the federal government or provincial government, uh, short-term commercial paper, which are short-term uh, debt of uh, well-known corporations. Uh, and so the return on those security-type funds would be less than you might get on another type of mutual fund that might invest in companies that are really growing and um, have strong potential for growth. Those type of mutual funds, we might call them growth funds. So the investment manager will buy only companies that have a strong potential for growth, and hence a little bit more risk, but the opportunity for a higher rate of return. Some mutual funds are designed to invest in, in um, companies outside of Canada, so uh, international uh, companies uh, or U.S. companies. Uh, so there are many, many different types of mutual funds and the, the key is to find uh, a mutual fund that meets your financial objectives. For instance, if you're a student, you might need the money next year. You would probably not want to invest in a mutual fund that has a high degree of risk, uh, a growth fund, but rather invest in something that is a little bit more liquid, takes a little bit of uh, less risk uh, in and buy a security fund. Uh, so there's a large type of a large number of mutual funds, and you can go you can go on Google and, and search mutual funds, and you'll see you'll see hundreds, if not thousands, of different types of mutual funds that are offered by uh, mutual fund companies. Some of the uh, um, Key players in the security markets are investment bankers, uh, and those investment bankers help underwrite uh, long-term finance projects of companies, uh, issuance of bonds, and, and selling, uh, selling shares. We'll talk more about those in, later on in the course. Stockbrokers are the person that you might deal with, and the stockbrokers are, are, are licensed to buy and sell securities on one of the security markets on behalf of their clients. Uh, today, more and more investors are uh, doing their own investment online. Many of the banks, many of the financial institutions are offering online investing opportunities so you can go online and uh, purchase and sell shares uh, right over the internet today. So I've talked about markets a couple of times and, and these are really securities markets that we're talking about. There's really two types of securities markets, um, and security markets are where, where securities can be bought and sold. So two types of security markets. One is the primary markets, and the second is the secondary markets. The primary market is where new securities are sold to the public. For instance, um, uh, company A wants to do some major expansion. They need a hundred million dollars, so they will decide to create a new share issuance. So they will, uh, to get their um, um, million dollars, they will go to the markets and issue new shares, sell new shares, and that is done through the primary markets. So the company will. Um, uh, work with investment bankers and, and stockbrokers and investment dealers uh, to create a prospectus 
and do an, what's called an initial public offering. So the first time that a class of shares is offered for sale to the public is all done through the primary markets. That is really the only place that uh, corporations will generate cash or, or money for ex expansion. Because after those shares are issued in the primary markets, investors who want to buy and sell those shares will do it in the secondary market. And it really doesn't have any cash flow implications for the company that issued the shares when tr shares are traded in the secondary markets. So secondary market is when uh, investor A, who owns the shares of company A, wants to sell it to investor B. So that will go to the, the secondary market. And it facilitate the secondary markets facilitate the exchange of those shares between investors. And really it doesn't have an effect on the corporation that uh, issued those uh, those shares. So it's important to understand that investors who are buying and selling shares will typically do that on the secondary markets. So they are trading amongst investors as opposed to the primary market when the first time that shares are made available to the public. So when we think about the stock markets, we're typically talking about the secondary markets. And really, the secondary markets holds or really facilitates most of the ex the uh, exchange of securities uh, today. Um, typically, an organized stock uh, uh, exchange uh, are organizations where whose premises securities are are resold. Um, so, uh, common exchange, common um, uh, organized exchange or public exchange are the Toronto Stock Exchange, uh, the TSX Venture Exchange. Uh, many companies in Canada actually uh, deal on the, the New York Stock Exchange, um, which is one of the, the, the largest foreign exchanges. Um, so, those are, are clearing houses or, or of brokers who will buy and sell securities on behalf of their clients. Really done on a, kind of an auction system, you know, where uh, uh, an investor or a stockbroker who has a seat on the exchange or a license to trade on that exchange will uh, offer for sale uh, securities at a certain price and there may be other people who will bid and they will negotiate a uh, selling price for your shares on the organized exchange. Uh, dealer exchanges are really don't, op dealer markets don't operate on a, a, a centralized trading floor but instead they use computers and, and that link dealers uh, throughout, uh, really throughout the world. NASDAQ is uh, really one of the largest um, um, electronic-based stock markets or over-the-counter markets uh, that uh, relies on technology to facilitate those exchanges. When we talk about markets, uh, we often talk about, uh, you may have heard the concepts of bull markets and bear markets. Typically, uh, if we're in a bull market, what that means is security prices are on the up on the, on the uprise or are going up, as opposed to a bear market, meaning the general uh, prices of securities that are being traded are trending down. So um, if you take a look at a long period of time, over 50 years or, or longer, typically markets uh, do go up. Uh, so generally over the last 50 years, the stock market has, has, has been bullish, as we say. So as I alluded to earlier, the, the financial services industry is going through a lot of changes. Uh, there are a lot more regulations, a lot more uh, controls that are being placed on uh, financial institutions in Canada. And uh, as a result of some of those uh, regulations and strict controls, uh, Canadian, um, the Canadian economy and Canadian financial institutions uh, did not suffer some of the same losses that we saw in the uh, United States in some of the uh, uh, financial crises in 2008 and in, in 2011. Um, 
In addition, there's a lot of uh, technological changes that are affecting uh, the banks. Uh, customers are demanding more and more online uh, services to be able to do all of their financial transactions, whether it's wiring money, whether it's um, um, uh, doing investments or trading online. So we'll see a lot more uh, uh, increased ways that consumers and businesses can do their banking going uh, going forward. Um, so the fi financial institutions uh, or the financial services industry is is undergoing rapid change. We're seeing you know meltdown of the typical four pillars of uh, the financial services industry. Those are kind of merging into one. Banks now own insurance companies. Banks own trust companies. Banks even own investment dealers. So those pillars that uh, were once very um, separate and unique are uh, eroding uh, in the markets today.